As Marshal of the University, it is my honor to declare open the proceedings of the 514th Convocation of the University of Chicago and to introduce the University's 13th President, Robert J. Zimmer. Please be seated. Good afternoon and welcome. As the Marshal has just announced, today's ceremony is the 514th time that the University of Chicago has assembled for a convocation. From the time classes began in the fall of 1892, the University has held a convocation ceremony at the end of every quarter, allowing students to be recognized and celebrated for their achievements immediately upon completion of their studies, and to do so through formal exercises, just as we do today. The primary purpose of convocation is, of course, to award degrees. But these occasions satisfy other important objectives as well. At convocation number one, on January 2nd, 1893, the university's first president, William Rainey Harper, set out goals for these ceremonies goals which, 120 years later, we continue to observe. Harper believed that these occasions of high ceremony are a necessary and nourishing part of the life of a university and intended to have them literally call together or cause to assemble all parts of the university community. In Harper's words, convocations are meant to bind together into a unity the many complex and diverging forms of activity which constitute our university's life and work. Today's ceremony, then, is also about reflecting upon the whole of what we do across the many libraries, laboratories, and classrooms that make up our campus. And in addition, it affords us all a moment to reflect upon the accomplishments of our past and the opportunities of our future individually, collectively, and institutionally. I confer the degrees awarded this afternoon by authority delegated to me by the University's Board of Trustees, represented today by Trustee Mary Lugorno. And I do so on behalf of the faculty of the University of Chicago that has the responsibility for the educational programs recently completed. I welcome you again to the 514th Convocation, a time-honored ritual that recognizes achievements of which we can all be proud. As Provost of the University of Chicago, it is my privilege to introduce Richard Rosengarten, Associate Professor of Religion and Literature in the Divinity School who will deliver today's convocation address. An expert on narrative theory and modern religious thought, Professor Rosengarten has written and lectured on the theological dimensions of works by such authors as Swift, Voltaire, and Ellison. He has also emerged as a sought after national voice on questions of the academic study of religion. Professor Rosengarten's critically acclaimed book, Narrating Providence, Divine Design, and the Incursions of Evil in the Novels of Henry Fielding, gave literary historians and religious scholars a deeper understanding of the author and of the ways that his work reflected shifting ideas about God's role in the universe. He is currently completing study of religious poetics entitled Styles of Catholicism, which will examine the theological dimensions in the work of Flannery O'Connor, Frida Kahlo, and Simone Weil. Professor Rosengarten's career at the University of Chicago has been marked by exemplary leadership and vision and a feared hookshot. After receiving his master's degree and PhD from the university, he returned in 1991 as Dean of Students of the Divinity School. From 2000 to 2010, Professor Rosengarten served as the Dean of the Divinity School, broadening the scope of the curriculum to include the study of Islam, 
expanding options for interdisciplinary scholarship, and working to make the Divinity School more affordable for its graduate students. The Div School's place as the premier institution for religious studies in the United States owes much to Professor Rosengarten's foresight and dedication. The title of his talk today is In Retrospect. Rick. Degree candidates and your loved ones and friends present here today or in spirit, colleagues on the faculty, deans, officers, trustee, Provost Rosenbaum and President Zimmer. It is an honor, a pleasure, and I am mindful of privilege to address this convocation in celebration of, as the university well phrases the matter, individual achievement as well as institutional progress and continuity. So, I first salute all you graduates. I commend your splendid accomplishments. And in that spirit, I invite us to think together about what it might mean to celebrate your work in the context of the university's motto, Crescat Scientia Vita Exquilater, belief in knowledge enhances life. I am a scholar of religion and literature, and what I shall talk to you about today is in a word, stories. I spend most of my scholarly time, scandal that it is, researching and teaching about modern stories, especially novels, satires, and autobiographies. In what follows, I call them narratives because it helps to connote what I most love about them, that they are at once as simple and as complex as any human being or any institution. And the word narrative serves, I hope, to convey both that familiarity and that complexity. I'll talk briefly today about two of the very best narratives I know and love, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe and Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, in which, to paraphrase my colleague, Jonathan Z. Smith, a certain magic dwells. I'll try to get at that magic by talking about the two cardinal features of any narrative. One is that they are always retrospective, hence my title. The other is that they always involve something that I'll call cognitive dissonance, and how these fit together and what it means for our experience of stories is my whole simple, but I think you'll see also complex, point today. So first, narratives are always written retrospectively. The teller is relating something that happened, or given the role imagination plays, adopts the conceit that something happened. The hero of Robinson Crusoe tells the story of his time on a desert island, told after he's returned home to merry old England, as though it turns, uh, though he does, turns out he doesn't stay very long. Jonathan Swift's Lemuel Gulliver relates his travels under the same conceit. The retrospective viewpoint they adopt implies that what happened wasn't fully or well understood as or when it happened. It also suggests that the teller who had the experience now understands it better. Told retrospectively, the reader will now hear the truth about it. It's the particular magic of these stories that readers naturally recognize and understand this dynamic of retrospection. It's no accident that Robinson Crusoe and Gulliver are known not only to adults, but to many children. So in reading these narratives, we effectively see the teller doing history with the crucial twist that it's fictional which means that the reader doesn't care whether the past they are making sense of references an actual event. This is worth pausing over. There were ample historical antecedents for the kinds of sea adventures that Defoe and Gulliver describe. Contemporary readers knew this, and part of the appeal is this verisimilitude to known events. The point, what makes it a story, not history, was not whether what Crusoe narrated was exactly what happened to Alexander Selkirk, perhaps Crusoe's most famous and arguably the most analogized historical antecedent. It was that seeming oxymoron, fictional truth. What this means has been of interest from the time of Plato and Aristotle. A useful recent formulation is the phrasing of the literary critic Frank Kermode, who wrote about the sense of the ending. 
what we aim to describe when, having finished a narrative, or increasingly these days, having seen the movie or the miniseries, we describe as tragic, or comic, or satiric. This sense we have of a narrative's ending references its cumulative effect on us, a question not of whether what we have heard actually happened, but of how we are supposed to judge it, how it makes us feel, and whether those feelings are true. This is often complex, the more so because what the narrative purports does not restrict the liberty of the reader. In Robinson Crusoe, it's clear Defoe wants the reader's sense of the ending to be theological. Crusoe comes to understand that God put him through such a trial as a sign of favor, and that the terror and the loneliness he initially felt when stranded on the island, his subsequent resignation to his condition, spawned an industry and productivity to make the best of it, that in turn made him a more self-conscious creature of God. He became, Defoe wanted us to think, a model child of God, and paradoxically, but not incidentally, a model citizen, thanks precisely to his isolation. Defoe's idea was not, however, the sense that some of Defoe's later readers made of his ending. Karl Marx is a great example. Marx loved Crusoe's story, but thought it was an allegory of the promises and the pitfalls of the focus on the acquisition of goods or capital. So we can see that in the case of Robinson Crusoe, the sense of the ending of a narrative, how we understand its retrospective view of events, once poorly understood, now brought to clarity, involves a complex negotiation between an author and a reader, a teller and a hearer. Swift grasped this at least as clearly as Defoe and was determined to exert a more forceful and controlling effect on the reader's reactions. After visiting the tiny Lilliputians and the immense Brobdingnagians, followed by a third journey to a motley of strange island societies, the winds and waves of some unnamed ocean deposit Gulliver in the land of the Huynhams, a polity of horses. Gulliver comes to regard the society as superior because it is utterly rational and ordered, and he speedily becomes a happy and devoted servant of the horses in charge. Despite this devotion, Gulliver eventually is banished from the society. This occurs not because of anything he does, but because he has become the unwitting but unmistakable object of the carnal affection of the yahoos, the ape-like creatures whom the horses subdue through a form of slavery. Fearing that Gulliver's arousing presence might galvanize insurrection or even revolution, the Huynhams expatriate their most loyal citizen. The reader last encounters Gulliver at home in England, deeply disenchanted to be resident in what he regards as an inferior society. His last words report that he keeps two horses in a barn behind his home, where he spends as much time as he can for the sake of superior conversation. Serious scholarly ink has been spilled over the question of whether Gulliver is at this point out of his senses, insane, and indeed over whether Swift, the author behind Gulliver, somehow himself went insane in concluding with this image. Whether that is so seems to me to make the mistake of treating this as history rather than fiction. Instead, we should think about what it can mean that our very gullible hero prefers talking with animals to talking with humans. However different in the degree of control they choose to exert, we can see that both Crusoe and Gulliver narrate events through a double lens, as they experienced them at the time and what is different as they now understand and reorganize them in the telling. I want to suggest that this double telling is innately human and that to think in retrospect is to think in this double way. To recall with as much accuracy as we can muster the details of our experience, and at the same time to arrange or to order those details to show their meaning, a sense that comes from knowing the ending, from being able to tell how it all turned out. The force of this is best conveyed by something much underestimated but crucial. Here's my aforementioned second idea. Implicit in this double way of thinking is that, you know, that is retrospection is what I shall term cognitive dissonance, by which I simply mean the discovery forced upon your awareness that something you took to be a settled truth is in fact demonstrably false. By way of illustration, I offer two examples, one personal and one public. I well remember the occasion when I learned from a noted demographer that we humans lie more often and more egregiously about the money we do or don't earn than about the sex we do or don't have. 
Some of you will be unsurprised to learn that this epiphany occurred when I was younger. A second example from the public domain would be that of the political pollster and commentator Karl Rove, who had a decided experience of cognitive dissonance, unhappily for Mr. Rove in a very public venue, on the evening of November 6th. Now my point in invoking cognitive dissonance is that the most interesting narratives are the ones that are motivated by this sort of revisionary experience. This allows a refinement of our formulation about narrative. To think in retrospect is to rehearse an experience of dissonance, and in doing so to rethink the world anew. This is what the narrative properly understood does for us, and it is essential to our humanity. We in this assembly might regard it as an especially salutary gloss on the university's motto, where the scientia is translated as retrospective narrative. Just as cognitive dissonance is the experience of finding oneself in error, narrative is its counterpart, the practiced human art of retrospection. Narrative relates what was poorly or partially understood from a viewpoint that can acknowledge it to have been such, from a better understanding that it simultaneously offers. The immediate and local application is probably clear, but it may merit brief rehearsal. Each of you graduates has thought, is thinking, or at some point will be thinking, maybe all three, in just this retrospective way about your time here. Some of you may regard it Crusoe-like as a kind of forging of a better person. Some of you may decide, like Gulliver and most of the faculty, that you want to spend your life talking to horses. Whatever your particular chains of circumstance, you will find yourself narrating retrospectively the life you have experienced towards some superior understanding. A few of you may even write about it. So true, so good, so beautiful, but so what? Perhaps you find yourself restive. You may be thinking, well and good, but what are we to do with this superior understanding? What you've, what you've described so far, Rosengarten, is decidedly contemplative rather than active. There's that other part of the university's motto, vita ex quo later, and I worry that what you're describing is all Crescott with your own particular scientia riding happily along in a sidecar. Very convenient for you, but why relevant to me? Well, this is a perfectly reasonable observation, worthy of the critical skills you've cultivated at this university, and I'll conclude by addressing it. So to the degree that the worry privileges prognostication over retrospection, it seems to me suspect. Put too crassly, I worry about a too speedy recourse to cash value. Our priests of prediction afford ample supporting testimony to my view. I know of no reputable economist, and at Chicago we have only reputable economists, who will tell you that we have reliable models for macroeconomic activity. Social scientists caution us that most citations and discussions of data are either misguided or overreach or both. Your recent predecessor in these pews, Nate Silver, has both a proven track record for discipline prognostication and a recent book, The Signal and the Noise, which discusses how we might discriminate the relevant from the irrelevant in the plethora of data literally at our fingertips. To the degree that our worry about the insularity of retrospection reflects an impatience for results, I don't myself find large grounds for sympathy with the objection. Indeed, I suspect that retrospection may well be our most useful mental exercise to discipline ourselves to find the true signal in the midst of all that noise. Talking to horses, it turns out, has its uses. So a blow for Scancia, and indeed for my particular Scancia, that turns out to be not the sidecar, but the very engine of staying on course as we move forward. Lurking close behind this, however, loitering with righteous intent, is a worry with which I not only sympathize, but resonate to the core of my being, the charge of solipsism. What's to keep our retrospection from being merely self-referential? Thinking in retrospect is, I've suggested, something that we do naturally even habitually, to a degree that familiarity allows us to underestimate its sophistication. It's a way to cultivate and refine our personhood. We make ourselves better by doing it. But such goods can also be overemphasized to the point of seeming sufficient in and of themselves. How do we avoid this? Well, a true scientia of narrative is the study not of ourselves, but of someone else. Much as we understand and empathize, very few of us wish, at least as adults, 
to see ourselves course cruising, as course cruising Crusoes or as gullible Gullivers. Reading their cases is an encounter first in the retrospective narration of someone else. We meet the teller in her or his otherness, albeit at the level of one of the most human of activities. Note, too, the terms of this engagement. Thinking in retrospect via narrative involves a confessional aspect. The teller testifies to her cognitive dissonance about an aspect of the past. At the same time, there is a tandem accompanying profession of truth. We discover in the retrospective telling of the tale the direct juxtaposition, indeed usually the intertwining, of the virtues of humility with truth-telling. So reading retrospective narrative and thinking about our own lives in retrospect suggests that the virtue of contemplation also involves the cultivation of the virtues. So retrospective narrative actually leads us outside ourselves, and we can see that a true scientia of narrative allows us to, as it were, drink the escalator of getting closer to real difference in the context of a common human activity. That, friends, is in my humble opinion, the most apposite definition of all the human sciences, the attempt to engage the most enduring questions of our common humanity with the most principled and disciplined respect for difference. If this is true, there is indeed no excolator without scientia. You have then ordered your lives admirably in pursuing your scientia and now embarking on the path to excolator. A final crucial point. The university's motto engages in a parallelism that would make the psalmist, who is above all a very great poet in the richest sense of the term, proud indeed. If there is no excolator without scientia, there can also be no vita without some sort of crescat. No enhancement without knowledge, so no life without belief. Some of you will know that this university's founders were affiliated with the American Baptist religious tradition. Themselves Christians living at the turn of the 20th century, they can and sometimes are, even on this campus that they founded, easily misconstrued. They did not impose their beliefs upon the university, even as they did insist steadfastly upon the rightful place of religion in its scholarly life. You, proce you processed past an exemplary expression of it when you entered the chapel today. They spoke of religion, never of Christianity, at the university. My own campus home, the Divinity School, was from the outset a place where the study of the world's religions and the idea that such study could include principled engagement with a various forms of Crescott was encouraged and cherished and remains so to this day. So my point is to say that no vita without Crescott is simply to acknowledge that no truly human life lives itself without continual reference to some deeply held value. To be clear, I don't know of any more impressively articulated set of such values than the religions of the world, but I also don't think the religions exhaust those possibilities, historically or otherwise. The real point of retrospective narrative is change, but it is change that is thoughtful and prescient and engages the past as well as the future. The challenge to each of you today could be articulated most concretely via a final short example that is most relevant to the majority of you who are graduating from our Booth School of Business. Adam Smith, the father of modern economics, is most often referenced in this regard for his The Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, which he published in 1776 and which articulates such, such staples as the division of labor. But Smith only wrote this after he had penned what he regarded as its foundational document, the theory of moral sentiments in 1759. In retrospect, we see Smith more clearly if we recognize the trajectory of his thought. No theory of wealth without a theory of moral sentiment. Those of you, who, those of you in what are in this winter quarter smaller cohorts in other parts of the university should go forth and think about your version of this formulation. Then act on that. If you accept the challenge, I promise you will engage in retrospective narrative on your way, and readily aver that in doing so, you will indeed be pursuing belief and knowledge to the enhancement of life. Congratulations.
As we begin the presentation of degrees, may I call your attention to the award of honors listed in the convocation program, as well as the names of candidates receiving degrees today in absentia. At this time, in the favoring presence of the congregation here assembled, the deans of several faculties or their appointed representatives will present the candidates for academic degrees to the president of the university. The associate dean and master of the biological sciences collegiate division will now present candidates for the degree of bachelor of arts or bachelor of science in programs in the college. Mr. President, these students have completed the prescribed program of undergraduate studies. On behalf of the faculty of the college, I now have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science. By, by virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science and welcome you to the fellowship of educated men and women. Frank Javier Alarcón. El Elizabeth Veronica Beatty. Rene Gong Cheng. James Thomas Courtois. Alexander James Donnelly, Lauren Mills Gahan, Catherine Elizabeth Henry, Jing Wen Hu, Mengei Ji, Taesok Kim. Watson Bernard Ladd, Devon Gray Lawrence, Hyun Jung Lee, Un Jin Lee, Sang Liang, Louis Yishi Liu. Richard Riojas Martinez, Andreas K. Nahas, Murinalini Peinumaka, Elizabeth Mary Perkins, Joseph Dalton Person, 
Mohan Ru, Andres L. Sanchez, Antonio Jorge Sevilla Dieguez, Joanna Sobiech, Dong Hyun Song, Amanda Jo Springer, Lindsay Wu, Yin Shi, James Walter Morris Sech. The Dean of the William B. and Catherine V. Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies will now present candidates for the degree of Master of Liberal Arts in programs in the Graham School. <clears throat> Mr. President, these students have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the William B and Catherine V. Graham School of Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. I now have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Master of Liberal Arts. You have successfully completed a program of advanced study in the liberal arts, and by virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Liberal Arts, and I express the hope that your learning will lead you to advanced knowledge in or enrich the practice of your chosen field. Bernice Greer Johnson. Daniel Stephen Kaplan. Donna Wiggs. The Associate Dean of the Division of the Biological Sciences will now present candidates for the degrees of Master of Science and Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the Division of the Biological Sciences and the Pritzker School of Medicine. Mr. President, this student has completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the Division of the Biological Sciences and the Pritzker School of Medicine and the special program approved by her department. I now have the honor to present her as a candidate for the degree of Master of Science. You have successfully completed a program of advanced study in the biological sciences. And by virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Science and I express the hope that your learning will lead you to advance knowledge in or enrich the practice of your chosen field. Erin Smithberger. <clears throat> Mr. President, each of the students I now present has attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and has prepared a dissertation that contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the Division of the Biological Sciences and the Pritzker School of Medicine, I now have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Irma Linda Checho. Ross Adam Keenholz. Vapuf Upadhyay. Erin Amanda White.
The Dean of the Division of the Humanities will now present candidates for the degrees of Master of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the Division of the Humanities. Mr. President, this student has completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the Division of the Humanities and the special program approved by her department. I now have the honor to present her as a candidate for the degree of Master of Arts. You have successfully completed a program of advanced study in the humanities. And by virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts. And I express the hope that your learning will lead you to advance knowledge in or enrich the practice of your chosen field. Shari D. Felty. <laughs> Mr. President, each of the students I now present has attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and has prepared a dissertation that contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the Division of the Humanities, I have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Keith Frederick Alderson. Andrew Casey Broughton. Christopher Cutrone, Alexander James Genick Sauce Berezowski, Lisa Heather Hicks. The Dean of the Division of the Physical Sciences will now present candidates for the degrees of Master of Science and Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the Division of the Physical Sciences. Mr. President, these students have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the Division of the Physical Sciences and the special programs approved by their departments. I now have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Master of Science. You have successfully completed a program of advanced study in the physical sciences. And by virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Science. And I express the hope that your learning will lead you to advance knowledge in or enrich the practice of your chosen field. Sean Abraham. Nihar Pubalam. Zhu Fang. Chen Gao. Wei Guo. Dylan Hall. Chad Lawrence Mikoliacek, Chen Zhang Tian, Stefano Alexander Scoto, Xiaoyan Sun, Wei Ling Tan, Qian Zhang. Mr. President, each of the students I now present has attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and has prepared a dissertation which contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the Division of the Physical Sciences, I have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, 
I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Arnab Banerjee, Sarah Michelle Rupich, Yonde Zong. The Dean of the Division of the Social Sciences will now present candidates for the degrees of Master of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the Division of the Social Sciences. Mr. President, these students have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the Division of the Social Sciences and the special programs approved by their departments. And I'll have the honor to present them as candidates for a degree of Master of Arts. You have successfully completed a program of advanced study in the social sciences. And by virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts. And I express the hope that your learning will lead you to advance knowledge in or enrich the practice of your chosen field. Joel B. Benedetti. Christopher Charles Corneli. Christopher Ivanovich. Gerald Christopher Kaufman II. Jessica Carmen Villaseñor. Mr. President, each of the students I now present has attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and has prepared a dissertation which contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the Division of the Social Sciences, I have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Sean Paul Bradley. Norel A. Giancana. Arena Goyle. Tracy E. Graham. Yuan Cheng Bellet Lee. Jolie Nicole Nahijian. Rosa Jeanette Williams. The Dean of the University of Chicago Booth School of Business will now present candidates for the degrees of Master of Business Administration and Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Mr. President, these students have completed the program of professional studies prescribed by the faculty of the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. I now have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Master of Business Administration. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Business Administration. And I express the hope that your work will further wise choices in the allocation of economic resources for the benefit of all people. Arun Abraham, Adam M. Adil, Manish Kumar Agrawal, Akif Ahmad, Wasim Ahmad, Aniket Apti, Udaya Baskar Arafapali, Amber Lynette Arthur, Imran Asharaf, Nicholas Asinas, 
Ludovic Amon de Lejar, Wunju Beck, Raj Bahadur, Nazrath Ula Beg, Oliver James Bailey, Adam Alexander Banks, Mahesh Benawal, Sanreen Bettinelli, Robert Anthony Bouillon, Marcy Helen Bittinger, Megan Elizabeth Barrier, Craig Black, William V. Brown, Carol A. Buner, Olga Viktorovna Billum, David L. Bird, Marco Antonio Cardenas Cardenas, Christopher Robert Carlovato, Rocio Carascosa, Matteo Catani, Barak Ismail Chandek, Ming Wei Chi, David Martin Thompson Chandler, Ruchera Shodari, Jimmy Chen, Vikramjit Singh Chuhan, Vikas Chodari, Mark Crisson, Dominique Serge Sibole, Kevin Michael Connolly, William E. Conway III, Michelle Lily Coulon Witt, Nicholas Stanton Kuhn, Richard Colgate Dale III, Joseph Arthur Daniels, Valentino Teobaldo de Prile, Mitztaka Dahari, Thomas Walter Delaney, Catherine DeMille, Audrey J. Dinkle, Toby Charles Dodd, Daniel T. Doherty, Angela Michelle Donaldson, Charles Patrick Dowson, Stefan Sebastian Dufresne, Bryant James Eggett, John Gray Eklund, Matu Ali, Olalikan Ayatundi Fabode, Babatunde Fajimarokan, Tahir Fariki, Ryan Michael Fidranich, Tamami Katsu Fang, David G. Fernandez, Jorge Ferreira, Brian Stephen Furlitt, Rachel Renee Fisher, <clears throat> Joao Pedro Fonseca, Arturo D. Frausto, Adam Jeffrey Fuleman, Michael Adam Gardner, 
Thomas R. Gein. Elizabeth Catherine Gish. Wolfgang Gottschman. Desmond Chinyung Go. Nolene Go. Xavier John Grizard. Yadi Guitana. Alexei Guriev. Benjamin David Hamilton. Liang Han. Ajez Hawk. Megan Kronberg Hart. Roberto Stiabudi Hartono. Tule Harwood. Frederick Havard. Karsten Olaf Hen. Catherine Hill Gottesman. Andrew Paul Himmer. Thomas Allen Hodeck. Chu Dong Hu. Kunyun Huang. Victoria Yanling Huang. Wenxi Huang. Jacob Charles Hubbard. Michelle Hunsicker. Chung Yul Her. Daniel James Ionello. Anoop Jalan. Brandon Christopher Jansen. James Jenkins. Noah Johnson. Edward Baudelet Johnston. Love P. Joshi. Vladan Jovanovic. Mandeep Kaur Jolka. Peter Jonathan Khan. Amit Kale. Elizabeth Marie Camel. Jason Robert Kenya. Alias Anastasios Kanjos. Roland Kaiser. John William Kelly. Sam John Kemp. Dean William Capreos. Dongwan Kim. Gapun Kim. Heejin Kim. Jinsuk Kim. Nicholas S. Klein. Kent A. Clemmy. Joji Koda. Satish Kodali. Robert Allen Cole II. Irina Vladimirova Kalava. Shivakumar Konakari Vasapa. Nikola Sabine Kunig. Krishna Kosuri. Vijay Kumar Kota. Lauren Ashley Kowalski. Tilo Kraus. Jonathan Andrew Kraus. Arun Kumar Manjalur Krishnamurthy. 
Irina Kumpan. Ryan Christopher Kunzi. Melvin Quack. Margarita Lamento. Ludovic Lasos. Jane Sui Cien Lee. Theodore J. Lin. Sarawi Linharada Narak. Luis Eloy Yanez. Joseph Shinkai Lo. Singi Lo. Vincent Yan Kui Lo. Thomas Paul Lucy. Sebastian Lutringhaus. Lang Yin Min Kin Ma. Li Chun Ma. Alexandra Mayette. Harshad Mali. Christy Marie Malm. Chuck Mamich. Igor Mamat. Manoj Mengalpati. Ajay Bajraj Manglani. Marissa Mann. Koshi Matthew. James M. Mattingly. Michael Stillman McCord. Jason Peter McLaughlin. Julie Ann McLaughlin. Jeffrey Means. Vivek Maheta. Rachel Amerman Melnick. Igor Meningot. Hatsuki Miyata. David Mo. Andrew Paul Molinari. Marat Moliboga. Edward Charles Moncrief. Akinto Miwa Adikunli Monan. Michelle Catherine Mulcahy. Ari Malyana. Molly Mulroy. Paul William Myslinski. Ataf Nabli. Kauru Naganuma. Toshiyuki Nakamura. David Yu Kiong Ung. Edwin Yao Leong Ung. Daniel James Nickel. Tatsishko Nishimura. Machi Artur Noga. Thomas David Noonan. Phil Chinadu Nawafor. Jeanette Ubel. Sungho O. Oh. Chaitan Oja. Beth V. Opperman. Olivia Jane Ostrand. Ricardo Oti. Sankat Navin Patel. Simone Pelado. Miguel Perez Huez. Bartolome Hawkins Pham. Aikchong Pua. William Franklin Pickrell. 
Camilla Nakiba Pierre. Daniel Jonathan Pearson. Ramji B. Pilipakam. Marcelo Santos Pinelli. Daniel Pinzos. Matthew Pomeroy. Justin Edland Porter. Matthew Lee Premack. Noor R. Puri Puranini. Manoj Kumar Pirohit. Erwan Kerne. Arup R. Raha. Amit Rahul. Vijay Bahu Reddy, Ramachandra Reddy. Amar Singh Rator. Antonio Manuel Rea Martin. Riaz Ahmed Razvi. Ryan Rickenbach. Marcus D. Relford. Kelly Marie Ripley. Sean Philip Ritzenthaler. Daryl Wayne Robinson. Pavil E. Rogionov. Matthew James Radoski. Robert Rohner. Daniel John Romanelli. Jared Isaac Rose. Matthew Roosh. Babak Sadati. Parikshit Sahai. Alejandro Salazar Simpson. Michael Scott Sanders. Dharmaguhan Satgunasingam. Rajiv Kumar Saxena. David Richard Scanlon. Oliver Shirley. Werner Schlossmacher. Don Jonathan David Schroeder. Olivier Edouard Roland Schuch. David Schultz. Peter Swingenschlogel. Sean Christopher Scollin. Vanessa Catherine C. Balaji Saker. Ketan Shah. Riyad Shaykh. Wasim Ahmed Sheikh. Kevin Shanley. Dayanad Ramchandra Shinde. Marco Sikh. Ahmed Asan Siddiqui. Parmjeet Singh. Omar Sino. Valerie V. Sinyev. Yulia Smonser. Kyle Brandon Sneed. Chandra P. Somani. Suresh Sridharan. David Buckley Staler. John Andrew Stamos. Arshel Stevens. Nicholas Adam Stone. Pietro Stoponi. Matthew Robert Straza. Ramakrishnan Subramanyam. 
Sukesh, Sergei Petrovich Suketsky, Kelvin Sum, Nan Soon, Chucheng Soon, Keita Suzuki, Travis Alonzo Swoop, Yusufanisa Sayed, Junichi Takayama, Nabil Talawit, Dobin Ang Tan, Alexander Tarasov, Dawn Wee Ling Tay, Masyar Tayebi, Jason E. Terry, Michelle Tesh, Malik Takar, Boris Theobald, Fenglin Tian, Carolyn Ann Tiango, Nisha Trivedi, John David Trupek, Dmitry Svetkov, David Tucker, Evgenia Ursu, Nicolas Valdez Penyafil, Jadesh Varma Chaneni, Dipin Vakaria, Ilya Velder, Santosh Kumar Vetsa, Mitu Kumar Vishwanathan, Sripati Vishwanathan. Michael Alexander von Teichmann Logagen. Mike W. Walker. Anne Wallen. Katie Ran Wong. Sim Loon Wong. Michael John Watson. Stephen J. Welch. Jabali Wells, Michael White, Lindsay Michelle Whitehead, David Russell Williams, Habe Shang, Makiko Yamamoto, Lu Yang. Sridhar Yarlagada, Edmont Xuan Yung Yao, Sarah Yi Peng Yao, Yoshihiro Yoshida, Christine Louise Soon Yu, Craig Anthony Yuen, Bernard James Zank III. Kristoff Zarzechny, Alexis Ju, Lingtao Zhou, Shen Zhou, Eugene Juchenko, Ulrich Zink. Mr. President, the student I now present has attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and has prepared a dissertation 
which contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, I have the honor to present him as a candidate for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. The Dean of the Divinity School will now present candidates for the degrees of Master of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy in programs in the Divinity School. Mr. President, this student has completed a program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the Divinity School for foundational education in the academic study of religion. I now have the honor to present her as a candidate for the degree of Master of Arts. You have successfully completed a program of advanced study in divinity. And by virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts. And I express the hope that your learning will lead you to advance knowledge in or enrich the practice of your chosen field. Dina Yahia Mahmoud Salahuddin Mustafa. <laughs> Mr. President, each of the students I now present has attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and has prepared a dissertation which contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research in the academic study of religion. On behalf of the faculty of the Divinity School, I have the honor to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and welcome you to this ancient and honorable company of scholars. Joshua Leonard Daniel, Elizabeth Ann Palmer. The Deputy Dean of the Law School will now present a candidate for the degree of Doctor of Law in programs in the Law School. Mr. President, this student has fulfilled all of the requirements prescribed by the faculty of the law school to qualify him for the profession of law. I have the honor to present him as a candidate for the degree of doctor of law. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of doctor of law, and I express the hope that your work will contribute to the protection of liberty and the advancement of justice. Austin Deuce. The Dean of the Irving B. Harris Graduate School of Public Policy Studies will now present a candidate for the degree of Master of Public Policy in programs in the Harris School. Mr. President, this student has completed the course of professional study prescribed by the faculty of the Irving B. Harris Graduate School of Public Policy Studies. I now have the honor to present her as a candidate for the degree of Master of Public Policy. By virtue of the authority delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Public Policy, and I express the hope you'll, that your work will guide public policy toward the enhancement of the common good. Jing Chen. Please stand for the singing of the university's alma mater.
This is a special day for all of you upon whom I have just conferred a degree. And it is likewise a special day for the family members and friends who may be here to join you. It marks the completion of your study, or at least one phase of that study, a path that I trust has been challenging. I hope you are enjoying this moment of celebration and perhaps moment of reflection that this convocation affords. You are now all graduates of the University of Chicago. Because of your achievements that we celebrate today with your family and friends, each of you will always be connected to the University of Chicago, a connection that I hope that you and we will foster for many years. The University of Chicago is an institution driven from its inception by an idea, an idea that one could create and continuously renew a university focused on rigorous, intense inquiry and analysis. The university, through its work every day, expresses the view that clarity derives from the clash of ideas, the challenge of assumptions, and the willingness to accept answers only when they meet the tests of argument. We seek understanding that is complex, expandable, and fluid, rather than simple and rigid. An understanding that reflects analysis rather than ideology, that accepts complexity over the comfort of simplicity that seeks to delineate both the power and the limitations of argument and an understanding always ready to incorporate new data which can emerge and which in fact must be sought. We believe that the best education, the most empowering education, and the most powerful learning take place in this environment of constant challenge implicit in a culture of rigorous inquiry and that this culture is responsible for producing ideas of power and importance to humankind. This focus on rigorous inquiry has defined the University of Chicago, its research and its education at all levels since its beginning, and it continues to do so today. The university and its culture are renewed every day by the work of its faculty, students, and staff. And while it is natural to focus on your own achievements today and what they mean for your future, you can also take great satisfaction in your contribution to the ongoing renewal of your university, the University of Chicago. I know that as graduates of this university in the coming years, you will be called upon to act, to speak, and to lead. And like so many University of Chicago graduates who have come before you, you will approach this challenge of leadership empowered by your University of Chicago education. The power of analysis and ideas that you have experienced here and that are now your own will serve you wherever your path takes you and whatever challenges you confront. Each of you who received a degree today has received help and support from parents, family, spouses, partners, children, friends, mentors, or university faculty and staff. And while it is your achievements that we mark today, all of these supporters can rightly take great pride in your accomplishment. And so to...
And so to all degree recipients, please accept my congratulations for all that you have achieved. I wish you all good fortune and happiness in the years ahead. Enjoy your coming adventures wherever they may lead you. This now concludes the 514th Convocation of the University of Chicago. Crescat Scientia Vita Escolator, let knowledge grow from more to more and so be human life enriched.